Good evening, everyone, and good evening to Lara Baladi, who is connecting from Egypt. Uh, before I start, Lara, I will make a very brief introduction about uh, myself, about you, and then we can start our conversation. So I'm Emanuela Mazzonis. I've assisted Francesco Bonami in creating the Mi Family project and platform. And uh, tonight uh, we are here with uh, Lara Baladi, who first of all, I want to thank to be part of his, this uh, online uh, public program that has been launched by the MUDAM in uh, October, 2020. So now today we are here for our fifth appointment. And I think it's also very nice to mention the fact that today is March 8th, the International Women's Day that we can celebrate virtually together myself and Lara and all the person who are watching us. So um, Lara Baladi is a, an Egyptian Lebanese multidisciplinary artist, archivist and educator whose practice spans photography, video, sculpture, architecture and multimedia installations. Informed by her critical investigations into historical archives and the study of popular culture iconography, her work questions the theoretical divide between fiction and reality and the cycles inherent to history. Lara won the Grand Nile Award at the Cairo Biennial for her ephemeral construction and sound installation, Tower of Hope. She received fellowships from Japan Foundation, MIT's Open Documentary Lab, and she was, among other places, an artist in residence art Art Omi, McDowell, and MIT. Since 2015, she has been a lecturer in MIT's program in art, culture, and technology. And in 2020, she joined the board of directors of Artist Sanctum, a cultural initiative supporting artists whose work contributes to social change. For more than 20 years, Lara has been on the board of the Arab Image Foundation in Lebanon and the Townhouse Gallery of Contemporary Art in Egypt. In uh, 2006, Lara founded the artist residency Nomadic Artists in Egypt's White Desert. And during the 2011 Egyptian uprisings, she co-founded two media initiatives, very important, Radio Tahrir and Tahrir Cinema which served as public platforms to build and share an archive on and for the revolution. Under the umbrella Vox Populi, Lara amassed a significant archive of data on the Egyptian and other global social movements that has been the basis for publications, media initiatives, and art installations, which she exhibits in museums, shows, and biennials. And uh, I'm referring here to the Transmedial Berlin in 2016 and the Kwanju Biennial in uh, South Korea in uh, 2018. Now I would like to ask you, Lara, my first question, if you can tell us more about the Tahrir archives and how it developed during the last 10 years. So good evening, uh, Emanuela. It's a very nice and long introduction. I'm very... Uh, honored and humbled. Um, it's really nice to be here. It's been so long we've been preparing this. So I'm really uh, looking forward to this conversation. So uh, just to set a kind of um, uh, overall view of the work that we're going to talk about today, the Tahrir Archives is really at the, uh, at the core of this uh, process. Um, it's called Tahrir Archives because it started in uh, 2011 in the very early days of the uprising in Egypt and around the Arab world. Um, when I saw a video that went viral online, which was uh, titled uh, Cairo Tiananmen uh, Courage. And uh, it was a, a video that, as its title indicates, looked like the Tank Man uh, event in Tiananmen in China in uh, 89. And uh, this, uh, this video prompted my, first of all, my participation to, to what followed after uh, in Tahrir and uh, the aftermath of the uprisings and, uh, and also to start collecting uh, footage on what was happening on the ground and uh, unfolding uh, events as well as uh, historical footage from 
uh, events that resonated with what we were exp experiencing in, uh, in the square. And so uh, from that moment, I did one of the first project which you mentioned uh, earlier is uh, Tahrir Cinema, uh, which was a direct uh, open air cinema in Tahrir and which was a kind of platform in which we had conversation uh, directly with people participating in the revolution, but also sharing archive and collecting archive. So exchanging USBs and uh, uh, CDs and so on and DVDs at the time. And so um, that was a kind of uh, setup for a series of works that followed throughout 10 years. So it's been 10 years now um, with uh, art installations, uh, video installations, uh, sculpture, media events, and also essays about the photography of Tahrir. Thank you, Lara. Um, I believe this is a, in a, a giant project that we could keep talking about only this project for a couple of hours, but we would like also to talk about the project you have presented in our Me Family platform. Uh, you have created a series of work, it's not only one, and uh, the, the work is entitled ABC, A Lesson in History, which stands for the uh, Fahir Archives. The first work is the Anatomy of a Revolution, and it's a work inspired by John Berger's essay, The Look of Things, where you gradually reveal two mirrored images, the Rembrandt's Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp and the uh, uh, photograph of Che Guevara in his uh, that bed. The second work is The Game, and it's a large uh, scale collage in the form of a board game that narrates the 2011 Egyptian revolution and its uh, aftermath. And the third work is ABC, a lesson in history, an Arabic ABC primer inspired by the uh, 90s. Uh, 50s propagandist educational books also available on the platform to download as a poster for the uh, public. So through this work, you are raising questions about the cycle of the revolution, suggesting a reading of history from a global perspective. I still remember when we had one of our uh, first call to exchange ideas, um, about your work and you were telling us the proposal for the show and at the time it was still meant to be a physical show in the museum. And then there at that phone call, you told us about your project ABC Lesson in History and all your ideas about turning propagandist educational tools through the study of the iconography of a revolution, a very um, difficult project very based and very deep. So I would like to ask you if you can please describe in detail the works and the idea that is behind ABC a lesson in history. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, so the works in the exhibition are part of a bigger series and they're all, uh, they've all come out of collecting this, uh, this archive, uh, starting in Tahrir, but then very quickly in 2014, especially when I moved to the US to start working with the archive uh, in, a, in a different way, um, I, uh, I, I arrived uh, at uh, the moment where Mike uh, Brown was uh, brutally killed by the police. And so the events in the US were incredibly close to what I had just experienced in Egypt. And so my archive became much more about uh, uh, the global, uh, you know, a global uh, archetypal understanding of uh, cycles of revolution and phases uh, that we go through in the process of revolting. And so the many shows that I did uh, between uh, 2014 and, uh, and 2018 were about these different phases. So the, 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 the pre-revolutionary phase, the uprising phase, the immediate uh, phase that follows the, the, the uprising and the kind of, um, uh, let's say the optimism that comes with the uprising. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the phase that is a kind of post-revolution status quo in which uh, uh, many things become uh, much more, um, it's a bit like if you go back to the French Revolution, it's the, the witch hunt. 
And so it's a time of assassinations, of arrests, mm -hmm. disappearances, and of uh, higher control even than before uh, the uprising. And so the, the work in the exhibition is very much about the next phase that follows post-revolution status quo, which is the history lesson. And so how do we think about that period? And, uh, and not just Tahrir, but 10 years of de uh, a decade of protests that is uh, not in a number that is unprecedented in history, even more than in the 60s. So how do we think about, uh, about history and, and uh, recalling history in that, um, in that context? Uh, and so this is what these works are about. They're about looking at the timeline of the Egyptian revolution, which is the game. Um, so it's, uh, it, has, uh, it plays on the idea of uh, the game as a monopoly game, as a game of power, uh, and uh, throughout the circling around the board, uh, you have the timeline of 2011 to 2013 using iconography of graffitis and, and the protest in Tahrir, generally speaking. Um, the second work is the video, which I'm very fond of because it's a work I did for the exhibition specifically. Um, and that really uh, establishes the idea of speaking a language throughout these projects of uh, analyzing uh, footage from previous uh, revolutions and recent ones, but also from the history of art and iconography of protests. So things that resonate throughout history much further down before the history of photography. Uh, and then uh, the ABC itself, which is uh, the first of two projects. Uh, so it's an ABC primer. Uh, and it really plays on a fantastic little book that I found in, uh, in Egypt and many other books that I collected during my travels. So it's uh, amongst other places, uh, Kiev, Ukraine, um, where uh, school books in the 50s and earlier used to be uh, incredibly uh, indoctrinating. Uh, towards belonging to the this kind of idea of patri uh, you know patriotism and nationalism and uh, uh, and you know you so so images from a very early age of uh, tanks of belonging to uh, army or of uh, of having some kind of level of morality in in mm -hmm. society was very much the language of these books and so here I turn it on its head and I look at. Uh, imagining uh, tomorrow being in charge of uh, history lessons and books and telling the history of uh, these moments of revolution through learning the alphabet. And so these, uh, the ABC is, a, is basically a, a technical a, a pamphlet that allows for learning the alphabet through one image, one word, one letter. And so this is the beginning, let's say, of a series that's, that I'm still working on, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute. Yes, absolutely. And um, talking about history now, uh, I'm also thinking about the fact that now history is very much nowadays linked to social media, to the role of social media um, today in our society. And I would like to ask you actually, what is the role of social media today as opposite to 2011 protest and how the role, if we can talk about role and impact of social media evolved in the last decade, especially linked to revolts, revolutions. Uh, so in 2011, the, what I think was interesting was, of course, the Arab uprisings in general, which also prompted the Occupy movement and all the other uh, following movements that we've uh, all uh, watched or experienced. Um, and uh, what was very interesting in terms of social media was really that what happened in that moment more than at any time before that is because things started earlier, like in Iran, for example, in 2009, Twitter played a huge role in the, in the protest. Uh, but in 2011, this collapse between virtual and reality really happened in a way that had never really been experienced before by, by the multitude. So, um, so suddenly our life online and our life in the street and in the physical world were very much merged and very much uh, interconnected. 
Um, of course, in Egypt, it was a big problem to call the revolution Facebook revolution because the majority of Egyptians didn't have access to Facebook, let alone to the internet. So, um, so this was very much uh, a moment where the role of social media was suddenly used as a tool by protesters to mobilize, to uh, generate uh, the next kind of response to the political unfolding uh, uh, on the ground. And so, um, and so, of course, it was an extraordinary moment in terms of uh, this uh, technology and, uh, and, this, uh, and this, this social dynamic that we were experiencing. Um, of course, afterwards, uh, the, the response of the state is to uh, repress these uh, platforms, uh, and not just these platforms, but, but all kinds of other communication platforms like Skype and uh, mm -hmm. think of another one, but Skype is a big one, for example, here. Uh, and uh, in 2013, uh, here in Egypt, the, uh, the, the incrementation of surveillance technologies uh, was you know multiplied by a lot and it's possibly the, the the place in the region where now we have maybe the highest surveillance system um, in uh, uh, in in a global context uh, social media uh, today is very different than 10 years ago we are in a society of control it's not new but today the society of control is uh, even uh, stronger uh, and we're also in a surveillance capitalism uh, society. So, so surveillance is not just to survey us, but to control us and to manu manipulate our behavior, but also to manipulate the behavior of our politicians, as well as manipulate our uh, politics. And so um, in countries uh, which have uh, autocratic regimes, uh, the social media platforms are uh, double-edged double swords. Uh, at the same time, they are almost the only place today where you can really have a kind of political conversation. But at the same time, and because of that, it's also the place where it's incredibly risky to have such conversations and where most people get kind of you know, pinpointed and targeted and arrested uh, eventually. And so, um, uh, at large, uh, on the other hand, what's happened too is that those social media platforms uh, have also increased in numbers and in types. And so you have also many more decentralized platforms, peer to peer, uh, which means that there are many more places where conversations are happening. But again, the danger is that the conversation is polarized and that it ends up being, uh, you know, that you end up speaking in a, in a closed circle. Um, the big tech companies have, uh, of course, a lot of power today, much more than they had uh, in 2011. And so the, 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 the challenge today is, uh, is to continue to diversify our ways of communicating and of ways of um, mobilizing. Thank you, Lara. I think that what you said is very much linked to um, uh, my third, fourth question. I don't remember now anymore what number we are at the moment, but I think that all your um, explanation about the social media is uh, absolutely um, uh, linked to what I, I'm going to ask you, you now in relation to the art world, because we know that today the evolution of the internet, the technological innovation, the uh, immense production of devices of all kinds that we are all using every day in our uh, daily life from iPads, iPhones, uh, laptops, watches, vocal assistants, these are all part of um, a society that is completely dominated by new media. And the artists as well um, are using these tools to analyze the impact uh, that these artificial transformation have had on our daily lives. And they're also using these tools in order to produce their projects. And now I'm thinking also about the fact that you, of course, are using internet, are using online sources, digital tools, uh, social media as uh, Facebook, just to name one, uh, for your Vox Populi, uh, Vox Populi archive. So, um, 
what kind of impact do you think the digitalization of our world have in the art world? So just trying to be more focused on the art world. Now we talked about society in general. They think that the art world will be very much impacted by this. I'm also thinking about our platform. We completely changed the idea of our physical show in order to um, create a project that could be um, experience virtually by the public. So uh, what is your opinion about the meaning of art in relation to uh, this globalized society today and this world dominated by internet and by social media? Um, so so I, I think, I think the, the, the question of technology in general and, and the digital technology in particular uh, is really a kind of push and pull uh, situation where artists will play with new technologies and be attracted by new technologies to kind of be challenged and see where these technologies can take us mm -hmm. kind of projects you can make with these new technologies but at the same time making uh, you know uh, working with new technologies allows also to improve these technologies and so art kind of feeds into technology kind of evolving and progressing while at the same time technologies changing and shifting uh, are forcing art and artists to, uh, to naturally kind of uh, shift the language in which they're making the, their art. So, so, you know, the new gen, I teach at MIT. So, it's <laughs> so you know, I see every day uh, students working with uh, VR, with AR, with uh, even with just with videos or, 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 or uh, digital, digital, yes, digital uh, tools that tools. we are familiar with for, you know, more familiar with to say, to, to be more specific. But, but, um, uh, but what I, what I'm always fascinated by is how the new generation, uh, is so at ease with uh, the digital world and how much that language is their language. Uh, you know, um, if I ask a student to learn uh, to use Photoshop, they, they come back two days later and they, they, manu they maneuver really easily uh, on a new software that they've just discovered. Uh, they use the educational tools online much more easily. Um, and so I think that has really, influenced and shaped also the kinds of approaches of artists making art. And of course, recently, the situation of the pandemic has really forced every one of us in that context of the art world to, uh, to really uh, challenge our, our ways of, uh, of sharing artworks or of reflecting and producing art so that we can eventually disseminate it. So. Um, so, so, so what we've seen is many things. I've, I've, uh, I've been fascinated recently by, uh, especially in the context of film uh, festivals that uh, have created platform and of course the exhibition we're talking about because that was a very big challenge to create that very platform where you go in with your avatar and you walk around and you, you almost like mimic the idea of being in a museum, but yet you're on the screen and you're also with other people visiting the, uh, the, the show and so on. But in, uh, in film festivals, there is also like a, a lot of, we see and not just in film festivals, but like in conferences and all kinds of gatherings, we see many more types of platforms being created specifically to welcome an event. And I think what's really interesting is that the future uh, is multi-layered. The future is multi-layered uh, and it's also deeper in a sense that there is going to be many more levels uh, in the virtual world uh, as in, in on internet, but also in the real world with augmented reality and uh, uh, new technologies that will create many more layers in our uh, experience of the world. And in that context, art will have to adapt. And, and I think the very even more coming upcoming generation will embrace these technologies, but also will embrace this understanding of reality in a very different way than we do, and will navigate 
these places and these platforms and augmented reality and so on in ways that will shape the kind of art that will emerge uh, in that, uh, with that generation. So I think it's very exciting in, uh, in lots of ways. Uh, and also, of course, it means that a lot of things will possibly disappear. Maybe museums will have to rethink and they will have to rethink their outreach uh, programs. They will have to rethink uh, what kinds of exhibitions and how they, they can uh, invite people to be interested to come to a space but at the same time to, to think about open source and about sharing uh, information, archives, uh, you know, treasures. And so, and so all of these things are going to be very much, uh, I think the challenge and, uh, uh, of, the, of the next uh, coming years. Um, speaking about uh, the future, the way museum probably needs to change the way to invite audience, the approach, the approach they have to offer. I would like to ask you if you uh, want to anticipate to us a little bit about your upcoming projects and uh, new ideas and new uh, works that you are working on or you have in mind to um, produce in the coming months and years. Uh, yeah, so I mean, what, what's uh, what's been really amazing is to is to work uh, with you on uh, on this project because uh, you know the work was very different the way we were thinking about it for the museum. Uh, it was almost a very in, intentionally analog exhibition, uh, and suddenly it had to become digital. So so it kind of forced me to do this video. And so I'm really happy I have this new piece because uh, it turned out to be much more layered and complex than what I had originally thought about. Um, and uh, it also uh, is the starting point for the project I'm working on, the main project I'm working on right now, which has been a ongoing process, which started at the same time as the ABC Primer. Uh, and which is an outcome of the primer because of course I'm very bulimic with images. I like excess. And so, um, and so my archive is growing constantly. And uh, as I was doing the ABC primer, I, I started to realize it was a limited space. So uh, it was a little bit like a test. And so now what I've been working on for the past uh, year and a half is uh, building a website uh, which is basically an artwork, a web-based uh, artwork, uh, which will be somewhere between a publication, a school book, an artwork, and a diary, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which will look at uh, um, the archetype, uh, the patterns, the phases, the cycles and revolutions, but through an abecedary. So from A to Z in the Arabic uh, alphabet, uh, I will um, uh, create a kind of narrative that flows from the beginning to the end of the alphabet. And that is uh, somewhere between uh, a narrative about, uh, about uh, iconography of protest in relationship to, uh, to art, like the example of Rembrandt and the death of the Che. Uh, but also about history of photography, iconic images. Uh, it's, it's very layered and it, it goes in lots of tangents. So it's a little bit of a ballad that I'm uh, proposing um, to, to engage with, while at the same time, it will be a place where you can find data on specific events and related material to each word in the abecedary. So it's actually a repository of my archive. And hopefully that will close this chapter and, <laughs> and this decade of uh, intense searching and bathing into uh, protests uh, and hopefully uh, give me a kind of open door to, uh, to, uh, to new to new. Thank you, Lara. I think that um, your explanation about new projects uh, uh, is just inviting us to discover more about your work in general. I mean, we could talk a lot about uh, social media future, as you said, multi-layered uh, platform, uh, about the important, uh, important of history today and about globalization, about art, 
uh, at this point, because unfortunately we are already running a little bit out of time, what I can say is that I would like to invite the public to spend more time in discovering and uh, analyzing carefully your work on our platform, as well as your Vox Populi actually timeline. And uh, when your new website will be complete. I don't know if you already have a deadline, if you know already when will be launched. In May and August. Oh, pretty soon. So yeah. yes. we, we have to remember that over the summer we could probably experience your new project, Absolutely. virtual project. And, um, and I think that was what is important for um, all of us as a as a public who is exploring your work is to um, try to find um, a way of considering how important is also our opinion, our intervention, our figure as an active participant and not only as a passive spectator. And this is what I think you were trying to do with your work that was supposed to be shown in the physical museum and that you try to switch to the virtual one. So I think this is the message we can also leave to the audience today and trying to be a, a real active spectator of art in general and your work um, more specifically. So I thank you, Lara, for this wonderful talk. And uh, I really hope to thank follow you. your new website in few months. Of course, I will uh, let you know, of course, when it's uh, online. Thank you so much for having me, Emanuela. Thank you, and uh, goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Lara. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.